Welcome to Sunday Night Live, live from Goldsboro, North Carolina, and huh. And I'm Harold Herring, and that's my fine wife, Beth. And we're eating cake from my mom and dad's 70th wedding anniversary celebration. And we knew of vows yesterday. Amen. And it was awesome. It was it awesome. It was awesome. And so I was just trying to get in a little cake and maybe let you have a feel <laughs> for... Vicariously. I mean to tell you, that cakes are good and make your tongue slap your tonsils. That's how good it is. How Amen. Are. It's a great day. A great day. <laughs> One we will remember a very long time. And they will too. We'll and you know, after the program. We are, we saw we missed you last Sunday night, but <laughs> no. there was no electricity. Yes. In fact, we didn't get it until Wednesday night. That's right. About 9.30. In fact, I could have seen Thomas Edison, I'd have kissed him on both cheeks. That's how happy I was to have electricity. Amen. Back. But you know, maybe at some point soon, we'll talk about uh, Hurricane Matthew and the miracles that Lots he of miracles. did for us. Yes, he did. And you know, but keep, uh, there are a lot of people still underwater, please keep, you know, North Carolina in your prayers and there's a lot of other areas too. Anyway. 76 days left. I was gonna say. In 2016. That's right. And it's time for each of us to prepare for the battles ahead and the victories to come. Amen. Hallelujah. Here are seven preparations for your inevitable success in the midst of any and every adversity. That's right. For you to be successful. Number one, prepare for the battle. Prepare for the battle. Ephesians 6, 13. Hold on before you do. Well, go ahead. I'll do it afterwards. Well, let me do it first. Alexander Graham Bell. He said one time, before anything else, preparation is the key to success. Amen. So be prepared for battle. And Ephesians 6.13 is about preparing for battle. This is in the Message Bible. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. We could really have preached this next week with testimonies on, you know, God's Word is an indispensable weapon. That's right. And I like the last part. Keep, keep each other's spirits up. Yes. So that no one falls behind or drops out. That's right. We, and there's been a lot That's of pulling together. That's a responsibility. That's right. There this week over with this, this hurricane that hit us. The word prepar pre preparation, preparation, according to the World English Dictionary, means the act or process of preparing and the state of being prepared readiness. Preparation is a mental decision before it becomes. Before is the key word. Preparation is a mental decision before it becomes a practical reality. That's right. Before any well-trained soldier goes into battle, they always check their equipment. They make sure everything's there. People who, uh, who uh, you know, either in the military or people who jump out of airplanes with parachutes, they there always check their pack before they get on the plane. That's right. They don't just trust it to somebody else. They check it. So there's preparation uh, before you face any enemy so that you can overcome any adversity hmm. and win every time. Amen. And, uh, and see, just as preparation is important in natural warfare, That's right. it's even more so in spiritual warfare. Amen. And we have to sanctify ourselves for, for the, the battle. battle. Joshua 7, verse 13 in the New Living Translation says, Get up, command the people to purify themselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Hidden among you, O Israel, are things set apart for the Lord. 
You will never defeat your enemies until you remove these things from among you. I think this would be a good time to remind each of us yes. of what's necessary to pure our, purify ourselves Amen. for the battle. And it's all right there in that verse, Joshua 7, 13. Mm -hmm. Seven keys to it. One, enter into his presence. That's right. Two, read your instruction manual, your battle plan, the Bible. Three, repent of what we know we've done wrong. That's right. And not only that, ask God to bring to your remembrance yes. anything that you have kind of overlooked. There you go. Uh, or forgotten. That's it. Number four, eliminate any doubt about the outcome of your mission. Number five, receive your forgiveness. Number six, determine who will be in the foxhole with you. And that's important. Yeah, it's good to know who's going to be with you when somebody shouts, incoming. That's right. So you know who's there. And seven, get out in front of the battle by praising God. Praising God. And one of my favorite scriptures, Joshua 3, 5. Yeah, it should be our expectation for every day. Yep, should be. For tomorrow, Jehovah will do wonders among you. If you want to be successful, you can never ignore or minimize preparation time. That's right. The price of success is always paid. Let me say it again. This is a good. The price of success is always paid in advance That's right. of the victory, never after the fact. I'd say that again. The price of success is always paid in advance of the victory. And never after the fact. We're always qualifying, always qualifying ourselves for the next level. And we won't get to the next level until we qualify. Number two, live a life of righteousness. Amen. Live a life of righteousness. First Peter 2.24 in the King James Version is much more than a healing scripture, although we often quote it as a healing scripture. It says, who is talking about Jesus? who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Now this is profound to me. Righteousness, in Strong's Concordance, is the Greek word G1343. G1343. Listen to what it means. In a broad sense, State of him who is as he ought to be. State of him as you know, who is as he ought to be. to be. Righteousness, the condition acceptable to God. Integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness. And listen to this. Mm. Correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. Amen. Righteousness is the correcting correct you know, the correcting correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. That's right. So righteousness is the state of him who is as, as he, he ought, ought to, to be. be. Uh, wow. And, and if you go back, honey, and you look at that, it says who should live unto righteousness, who has, who, who has the correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting by whose stripes you were healed. That's right. There's a progression there. Mm. And uh, that's... Uh, and that is that we could preach a whole sermon on that one. We could. But... So the question is, yeah. how ought we to be? We ought to be walking victoriously, victoriously. Mm -hmm. walking in victory, winning every battle because of the greater one who's in us, That's right. who empowers us That's right. against every enemy, every, every adversary. Amen. I think I shouldn't have eaten that cake. I'm having trouble speaking here. A sugar rush <laughs> instead of a Holy Ghost rush. That's it. Yeah. Everyone who is serious about the cause of Christ right. should be striving to be mm. as they ought to be with correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. Right. Now, how can you be, how can you achieve that? The Word of God. That's it. Proverbs 4, verse 18 in the Amplified Bible. But the path of the uncompromisingly just and righteous is like the light of dawn that shines more and more brighter and clearer until it reaches its full strength and glory in the perfect day to be prepared. Meaning that we are precept upon precept, line upon line, every day when we are in the Word, we're building that. We're, you know, 
every day that the light of dawn comes, we're shining more brightly because of what we've done the day before, and we're planting more seed, and the harvests are coming forth, and we're shining brighter in Him as we grow in grace, really, of our Lord. How are we to be? With correctness of thinking, yes. feeling, and acting. How do you achieve that? Seven words. Read your Bible. And do what it says. That's it. That's right. Read your Bible. Do what it says. And it says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, in the New Living Translation, preach the word of God, be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. See, if we're ready, we're ready. Patiently correct, rebuke, encourage your people with good teaching. Meaning that's, he is a pastor and he's passing this on to his people. But you know, it's not just the pastor passing it on to us. It needs to be us feeding ourselves the kind of nourishment, you know, that we need so that we are prepared at the right time. Hallelujah. Amen. Number three, move outside your comfort zone. Oh boy. If you're living in a comfort zone, it's, it's because of something you don't know yeah. or you're not willing to do something with what you do know. You might, yeah, that's right. One or the other. Romans 1.13. It says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Listening to the Holy Ghost. That's listening true. to the Holy Spirit and letting Him guide us into what we're doing. According to Strong's Concordance, the word ignorance means not knowing. And simply said, ignorance is not knowing the facts. Ignorance is not knowing the promises of God, right. the precepts of God, and the power that comes from obeying the Word of God. That's right. Uh, but there is a cure for ignorance. Get facts. Amen. If you like knowledge, frankly, it's your fault because knowledge is available. Mm, it is. Psalm 119.66, Psalm 119, verse 66 in the New Living Translation says, I believe in your commands. Now teach me good judgment and knowledge. There have been times when I've actually prayed that scripture over myself. Lord, teach me. You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't mind when we ask him. Teach me. Show me. Show me these things. Because I believe in your commands. Now I want it to be stronger and firmer and, and more entrenched in my life. You know, to be able to be a work, working it out in my, you know, hmm. I could really get into these other scriptures. Working out your own salvation, it says, with trembling and self-distrust, leaning on the Holy Spirit. I believe that's in Ephesians. But anyway, the point being, um, the point being is if you don't like where you are, are in life, you know, you're the author of your book. You just write a new chapter. You write a new page in it. You change what it is that you don't want by applying the Word of God and not letting the enemy defeat you. If you don't like where you are, there's either something you don't know yet or something you're not willing to do something about. Yeah. One or the other. So. And so if you don't like where you are, it's really kind of your own fault. Well, and you know, we can get knowledge and we can get wisdom by seeking them. And that's what Proverbs 4 verse 7 says. Now, I know that seems like a harsh statement, but it's a fact. No matter what's going on, you can, you know, God gives us. Mm -hmm. The strength, the ability, the wisdom, the insight to overcome it. That's right. So if, if you don't like where you are, then the question is, what are you doing yeah. to get about it? I mean, because if all these scriptures are, are true, mm -hmm. and they are, because God's not a man that he should lie, then why are you where you are? If you don't want to be there. If you don't want to be there. I mean, that's just... Well, and sometimes it take, it's lying upon... I mean, it is lying. It's like you keep bringing it before the Lord, bringing it before the Lord, bringing it before the Lord until it comes to pass. You keep planting the seed, planting the seed, and you never know when you're going to just tip over, it's going to just tip over into your side. But it's just a matter of continuing faithful even when it doesn't seem like anything's happening. Because like we talked about earlier, honey, you know, we're actually working our way out of this job into the next job, from this level to the next level, from this glory to the next glory. You know, in the 
power of his might. Proverbs 4 verse 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. So we didn't get wisdom every day by learning a little bit more and applying a little bit more. It's not just learning, it's applying. And with all thy getting, get understanding. I can tell you this. If you want to move out of the comfort zone, mm. then you're going to need to get wisdom. That's right. Because obviously the wisdom you got is not getting you out of where you are. It's only taking you thus far. Thus far. It's taking you this far. So you need to do something different. That's right. From time to time, several years back, I wrote seven questions. And from time to time, I posed those questions because I think it's things we need to be reminded of right. and provoked about. And here they are. Number one, ask yourself. You know, don't answer it to me. Answer it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you read your Bible on a daily basis? There you go. Do you read your Bible on a daily basis? Do you take notes on what you've read? Does the Holy Spirit bring to your remembrance things as you, you know, read and take notes? Uh, are you reading any book other than the Bible at the moment? Mm -hmm. Is the book motivational, inspirational, practical? You know, I, uh, I know a lot of people like to read fiction, Christian fiction. I'm happy for them. Uh, but I don't have time for Christian fiction. Uh, you know, the enemy tries to make my, my life a fantasy. And it's not fiction. It's reality. Well, I think it's, you know, and there, and there are and like... And I'm not criticizing people yeah, because who want to read that. Yeah, because I think a lot of times there are certain, there are certain things that can be, I would say encouraging in some of it. I know since when our girls were young and they were teenagers and they read Christian fiction, it led them to make proper choices and to, to see the consequences when they didn't, you know. I mean, when people didn't, and it, and it can lead you in that way. But we're at a stage in our lives where we're just, you know, show well, me how to do it all better. Anybody that reads Christian <laughs> that's right, we're not saying yeah, that. That's where God's got you. Exactly. And he's showing you things through that. Exactly. Thank you, Jesus. That's the question. Is he showing you something That's through it? it? As the Holy Spirit's stirring things in you. As you read as the book. As you read the book. That's right. If the answer to no, if you answer no to more than one of those questions, you need more preparation in the Word mm. to get outside your comfort zone. Sometimes uh, we don't want to get outside our comfort zone, and that's, that's part true. of the opportunity. So, Get wisdom to move from where you are to where God wants you to be. Amen. That's what you Amen. can do. Amen. And number four. Number four. Follow his instructions. Amen. Follow his instructions. When you prepare for your destiny with the word of God, amazing things begin to happen. You know, once you get into the amazing things, then you really want to get outside your comfort zone and you really want to start doing these things because you see God doing stuff and you think if he did it this time, he can do even more. And it kind of fires you up. But Deuteronomy 8, verse 11 through 16, this is so good. In the Message Bible says, Make sure you don't forget God, your God, by not keeping his commandments, his rules and regulations that I command you today. Make sure that when you eat and are satisfied, built pleasant homes and settled in, see your herds and flocks flourish, and more and more money come in, Watch your standard of living going up and up. Make sure you don't become so full of yourself and your things that you forget God and your God, the God who delivered you, I'd like to add in in the first place, delivered you from the Egyptian slavery, and that's really what we were. We were all in the slavery of the enemy until we were delivered. The God who led you through that huge and fearsome wilderness those desolate badlands, crawling with fiery snakes and scorpions, the God who gave you water gushing from the hard rock, the God who gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never heard of in order to get, give you a taste of the life to test you so that you would be prepared to live well in the days ahead of you. So see, there, that goes really back to what you said earlier. We're, if we want to go to the next level, we're going to have to qualify first. You know, it's all, always the qualification is first, then we move on up. Second Timothy 3, 
verse 17 in the easy to read translation says, using the scriptures, those who serve God will be prepared and will have everything they need to do every good work. By the same token, yeah. a lack of knowledge about the scripture would definitely restrict, if not prohibit, yes. the blessing flow. We don't As Matthew twenty two twenty nine says, you err uh, because you don't know the scripture. Right. And you don't know the power of it. So what that does is restrict your ability mm -hmm. you know, to be, well, for God to do supernatural things in your life. Amen. And there's a psalm, too, and I wish I'd looked it up to put it in here. There's a psalm where it was talking about the children of Israel. It's in the middle somewhere. And it talks about the children of Israel and, and their, you know, problems and trials and tribulations through the wilderness. And it said, and they turned back and limited that caught me the first time I remember reading that and limited the Holy One of Israel, meaning they limited what God could do in their lives by what they were doing. So we need to always be confessing the word, not limiting what God wants to do in our lives. How? Reading our Bibles and doing, doing what, what it, it says, says will take us over the top. Number five. Amen. Exercise His gifts. Yes. Exercise his gifts. John 14, verse 26 in the Amplified Bible. But, and who lives inside of us? The Holy Spirit. But the Comforter, Counselor, Helper, Intercessor, Advocate, Strengthener, Standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place to represent me and act on my behalf, he will teach you all things and he will cause you to recall, will remind you of, bring to your remembrance everything I have told you. So we have within us. And at, at our disposal. Too. At our disposal, the mind of Christ, it says in the scripture. But we have the Holy Spirit who can bring to our remembrance those things which we know. But see, if we haven't read the word, we won't know what it is that we need to remember. We won't know that we have the nine power gifts of the Spirit. Exactly. Available to us. That's right. Gift of wisdom, knowledge, discerning various spirits, mm. speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, faith, working of miracles, and the gift of healing. And you can find all of those written about in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. That's right. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. In, in preparation for kingdom business, our Heavenly Father allows us to to tap also into what's most frequently called the motivational gifts of the Spirit. Yes. And you find those in Romans 12, 6 through 8. And he, this is in the Amplified Bible, the listing of them. Having gifts, faculties, talents, qualities that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. He whose gift is prophecy, let him prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. He whose gift is practical service, let him give himself to serving. He who teaches to his teaching. He who exhorts, encourages to his exhortation. He who contributes, let him do it in simplicity and liberality. He who gives aid and superintends with zeal and singleness of mind. He who does acts of mercy with genuine cheerfulness and joy joyful eagerness and the very good news God wants us fully prepared yes to operate in these gifts he wants us prepared to operate with kingdom power the kind of kingdom power that he wants to release through each of us that's right and the how he impairs us so it's important that we're prepared to use these gifts amen and the way we get prepared Read your Bible, do what it says. That's right. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. This is in the Message Bible. Message Bible kind of zings right in there. So here's what I want you to do, it says. When you gather for worship, each of you be prepared with something that will be useful for all. Sing a hymn, teach a lesson, tell a story, lead a prayer, prove, provide an insight. If prayers are offered in tongues, two or three, uh, two or three the limit. Two or three is the limit, and then only if someone is present who can interpret what you're saying. Otherwise, keep it between God and yourself, and no more than two or three speakers at a meeting with the rest of you listening and taking it to heart. Take your turn, no one person taking over. Then each speaker gets a chance to say something special from God, 
and you all learn from each other. If you choose to speak, you're also responsible for how and when you speak. When we worship the right way, God doesn't stir us up into confusion. He brings it into harmony. This goes for all the churches, no exceptions. When we worship the right way, yeah. God doesn't stir us up into confusion. He brings us into harmony. Decently and in order. That'd be a message for a lot of churches. Yeah. Uh, and the people in those churches mm. to grab a hold of. God's not the author of confusion. Right. So what happens if we don't use the kingdom gifts that God has for us, that he wants us prepared to use? It says in Luke 12, 40, 47, in the New Living Translation, and a servant who knows what the master wants but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions will be severely punished. That's pretty strong. It is. I'd like to study that more. But I think that one of the things that, and we've brought this up before, is that there are people, you, when you have a calling on your life, sometimes you can get distracted, you might say. Um, and when I say distracted, it's like when the Lord, you know, leads you to do one thing. Like, we, we, I think uh, somebody had used an, a, a, an example of this. When you hire somebody to paint, you know, your barn, and you come home and they painted your porch because they felt like that was the thing that, they, that you needed most. That's not following your instructions. And you wouldn't be happy if that happened to you in the natural. But sometimes when we go to do something for the Lord, you know, we, we go, well, I think this would work out better. That's not listening to the instructions and doing what it is that he's directed us to do. And I think that's where it goes about listening to the Holy Spirit and doing it according to how he's leading you to do it. That's very good. Good example. Number six, assume a leadership role. You may not see yourself as mm -hmm. a leader, but God does. That's right. We have been called to be ambassadors. But I'm going to read 1 Peter 3, verse 15. This is in the new NIV, New International Version. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I think this scripture is needed more today than probably any time I've ever lived. I mean, really, because there's so much confusion as to what is right and wrong and what, you know, what, what should we believe and what should we go with. We really have to go by what the Holy Spirit's leading us because there's just too many conflicting things, you know, but we know, we, we, we know because miracles and, and, and light, guiding and the leading of the Holy Spirit has come through us and we need to be able to back that up and, and give our testimony. And it's just, that's our story, the testimony of how the Lord has come I love to brag on God, and there have been so many things this week that we could brag on God about, because when you're flowing with Him, He just He just allows you to impress on people the power that is behind, and the the strength, and the provision, and the protection of the Holy Spirit, and the and and loving the Lord, that people miss out on because they're not seeing a strong Christian witness in people. That's very good. That verse says, always be prepared yeah. to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. There's nothing in that scripture that says, pastors, always be prepared to give an answer. Prophets, always be prepared to give an answer. Apostles, always be prepared to give an answer. Teachers, always be prepared to give an answer. Evangelists, always be prepared to give an answer. 1 Peter 3.15 is not limited right. to what we traditionally call the fivefold ministry. This verse applies to everyone. Everyone being prepared. Seeing us, hearing us, listening to us, or reading it in the email on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. it, it applies to everybody. That's and, right. and, and see, leaders need to be prepared to give answers and to take the lead in conversation. But then... And, but we're all leaders, is what Harold's saying, because we all need to be ready and prepared to be able to show forth the blessing and the wisdom of God. Ezekiel 38, verse 7, in God's Word translation, says, Be prepared. 
Be prepared, you and all the soldiers assembled around you, you will be their leader. We are to all be prepared. Somebody's looking at us as a leader. Somebody's looking at us as an example. And we need to be prepared. You can personalize that scripture too. Yeah. Number seven, the soil must be prepared for the seed. The soil must be prepared for the seed. My parents worked as sharecroppers until I was about three years of age. Our home was about a mile off the highway. We didn't have uh, electricity. I know what that's like. We didn't have it for four days this week. That's right. But they didn't have it at all. <laughs> didn't have electricity, that. didn't have indoor plumbing. Um, but I, I remember very young playing at the end of these, you know, there were, you know, sharecroppers, these, these rows Long of rows. crops, you know, whatever it was, corn, tobacco, whatever it was. And they'd be out, mom and dad, I'd be working. And I'd be at the end of that row and I would be playing and uh, they, where they could keep an eye on me. But what they were doing was turning the soil for whatever crop they were about to plant. Because the soil had to be prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, we still have a yellow road grader that they bought me when I was about that age. And I'd get out there and boom, 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 do you like that? Yeah, I did. And I'd play with that road grader and uh, at the end of the rows. But one of the first things you always do mm. when we move to a new house is you prepare the flower beds or now the garden since you've become a gardener. I have gone up to the next level. You have. <laughs> we'll call you Ms. Green Jeans. Oh, gracious. <laughs> remember that from Captain Kangaroo? Mr. I Green do. Jeans? Yes, I remember. Okay. I got that. You got it. But here, here's the thing. Soil yes. must be prepared for the seed. That's right. Soil must be prepared for the seed. And Jesus compares the soil to our heart condition in the scripture he does. And that's why it's so important to be faithful. And it has to be done Yes. before the first seed is sown. That's right. In the parable of the sower, Jesus gives four different spiritual heart conditions and using the example of a farmer for the crop. Mm. First, those who had an ungrateful heart won't be able to receive the seed of God's Word. That's right. Doubt and cynicism allow no place for the hope of His promise. That's and why it's important in for Word. people to see that in us when things happen for good. Go ahead. Sorry. We quote F.F. F. Bosworth a lot. Oh, yeah. If you've never read Christ the Healer, you need to read it. Well, to me, one of Bosworth's greatest quotes was he said, faith and doubt cannot live in the same house. And you either believe it or That's you it. don't. And you can't, you can't mentally, you know, um, you know, give mental consideration to it without giving heart and faith consideration to it. And that's why and it's so important to continue to read until your, as your faith grows. But here's the deal. The person with a hard heart yeah. absolutely has no hope for their situation yeah. or circumstances changing better. Mm. Second, those who have a shallow heart with many stony places are easily offended. When things don't go the way some people think they should, they abandon what they're believing for. They abandon what they're working on. Too many times I've heard people say, for instance, yeah. well, I've tried tithing and it didn't work. I was just thinking about that. I gave that. offerings and nothing happened. I never received a harvest. Yeah. This giving stuff doesn't work for me. Well, when, when people make statements like that, you know, the truth of the matter is that God was trying them to see if they'd be faithful stewards mm -hmm. or if they'd quit. You know, you know, the question is not whether it works. Yeah. It's whether or not you work and you believe. Yes. And you hold on to the word no matter what your circumstances are like. That's right. God never gave up on them. Never has, never will. Um, but they gave up on him. Yeah. And they gave up on the promises in his word. And uh, a person's expectations yes. has to be rooted in the Word, has to be rooted in the Word. I think another thing too, when we, we, I keep referring back to the children of Israel though, and it says, and I think it's Isaiah 45 somewhere, 
it said everything that God promised the children of Israel came to pass. Now, when you think about that, you go, well, you read all of the things that went on with the children of Israel. See, it took time because they weren't ready. I mean, they had a slave mentality. We had, they had to get rid of the slave mentality. Then they had to build themselves up. It's not going to happen to you overnight. You know, you cannot take the elevator to the top. You have to take the the stairs one step at a time. So, you know, when people say, like Carol was saying, and that's the first thing that came to my mind, well, I tried tithing, you know, and it didn't work. No, tithing tried you, and you gave up on it. So it's a matter of, you know, persevering, putting it to the test. And he says in Malachi 3, test me now. See if I won't open the windows of heaven. Yes, things negative are going to happen, but it's when we stop looking at where our, the negative is and start doing the Word of God and keeping on the positive focus that it's going to take us up and over. And one of those scriptures was, you know, way back was said, with prayer and with praise on our lips. Praising God will take you out of a lot of negative situations. So it's not a matter of it not working. It's a matter of us working it until it works, you know. When people say they tried giving and it didn't work, yeah, they're basically voiding the Word of God and just tell it like it is. Mm. They're actually calling God a liar. Well, they're sowing seed and they don't see it immediately. They don't see that. And that's what God gives us a perfectly the reason I say that, honey, reasonable. They're saying yeah, that God is, example. they're calling God a liar. Yeah, I know. It's because they're saying it is not faithful to right. his word to do what his word says. What they really did was, was they tried God, but they quit because mm -hmm. it didn't work on what they thought their timeline right. ought to be. And, and God's promises are yea and amen. And God's, and, and it's not a question of if they'll work, but when they work. That's right. And when it comes. And well, if you give up. I'm trying to think of who said the quote, you know, if you believe it will, it will. And if you don't believe it will, it won't. Let me say this. Let me say this. If you say, if a person says, well, it works for other people, it doesn't work for me. Mm. Then what you've just done is to call God a respecter of persons. Yes. And what you've just done is basically... To, to, to call him a liar. And negate. Uh, and negate a everything he's done because the word says. Yeah, in Acts 10 34. Yep. That God is no respecter of persons. And in Numbers 23 19, he says, it says that God is not a man that he should lie. That's right. So, so Amen. a seed that's falling on stony ground yeah. is doing it because the, the sower is not paying attention to the details. Mm. So if, if you've sown. If the Spirit of the Lord told you to sow a, a huge seed and, and you're not seeing the harvest, you know, don't ever doubt that seed. Uh, because it says in Galatians 6, 7, whatever you sow that and that only, you know. It's what you will reap. It's what you will reap. But you can't doubt. If you doubt, you're going to do without. That's it. That's what it says. Third, if your heart is crowded with weeds or the cares of this world, including the deceitfulness of riches mm -hmm. and the lust of other things. The seed planted in your heart will soon be choked out without producing any, any fruit. fruit at all. That's right. As you travel down the highway of life, there are a lot of buds, birds. Mostly buzzards. Buzzards sitting on the power lines. That's right. Power lines waiting to swoop down and, and gobble up your seed. That's right. Um, I heard a motivational speaker for a large networking company say one time years ago, fake it till you make it. Well, living a lifestyle beyond your means ends up in the D words. Debt, depression, discouragement, That's right. disappointment, That's right. despair. Don't fake it till you make it. You don't have to fake it. That's right. Just do what the Word of God says. Keep on, yep. And hold on. Living a lifestyle beyond your means is a prescription mm. that will print, prevent you from giving the way God wants you to give. Yeah. And giving is how it grows. 
is planting that seed and, and getting the harvest. And as we often say, honey, financial freedom is not based on how much you make. That's right. But rather how little you owe. Yeah, I mean, I I know some some believers that had amazing financial miracles and blessings, mm. but they just Spend it found all. themselves more deeply in debt. That's right. I have a good friend. We do. He uh, he has a seven. He makes seven figures, low seven figures every year, but he owes all that. You know, I guarantee you, he doesn't end up the year with any money he can put in the bank. Because everything he makes, he it's spends. It's all tied up and stuff. And, and, and really, it's um, you know Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law says that expenses will always rise to meet mm -hmm. income. If you get an increase in income, here come your expenses. That's right. Parkinson's law. You know, expenses always rise to meet income, and that is unless you say. Right. You know. Um, you know. Delay is not denial. That's right. And, and don't ever say, now we can buy this or that. Um, because when you do, you're overlooking the avenue to your blessing and the one who brought you to the dance. That's right. And there are a lot of believers who will give God the credit, but they don't want to give him the cash. <laughs> there you go. Credit so. and cash. Well, and you know, when you're first starting out and you you haven't, you know, you, you're eating at... Um, the cheapest fast food restaurant in town, oh, and then you can this. get, you know, then you start making a little bit more money. And then you start eating a little bit better place, you know. And then it, as, it, as it rises, and it's just, that's, that's a great example of how that, you know, m rises up to meet that income. And you, you're starting to, you know, feel uh, things a little bit differently. So. When we moved to Fort Worth, Texas. Yeah, I was I'll thinking tell this about real that. Quick. Real quick. When we moved to Fort Worth, Texas, uh, we were so broke we couldn't pay attention. Um, and uh, we take our young children and we go eat. There was a place called Poncho's. And Poncho's. All you could eat. All you could eat buffet. Cheap. And they had these little flags, and you roll the flag up, and that tells the servers you want to bring something else. And if I remember right, it was three ninety nine for adults. And the and kids ate free if they were like six and under or something. Something like that. Otherwise, it was $1.99. And they were all young. And we ate at Poncho's. Yes. And we were happy at Poncho's. That's right. Until we made more money. Until we made more money. Then we moved up from going to Poncho's to going to, to a place called Ryan's. There, uh, a little different higher buffet. Actually, it was the other one first. And I'm trying to think of the name up on the hill. Anyway, that one was like a furs. Yeah. Furs. Yeah, furs. Because we we it wasn't quite Cafeteria. as good. Cafeteria. And Our then, daughter Zan is with us, and she remembers. That's right. Yeah. Then we ate at Furs, and then food was mm, okay, mm. not as good mm. as Ryan's. Yeah. Then we got enough money where we could eat at Ryan's. Oh yeah. Moving on up. That's it. We so that's how it happens. Buffet. That's how it happens. So. And then we left Ryan's as we made more money. That's it. And mm. we started going to other places. That's and the we, point of that's it. That's the point. That's the we point of to, it. I love Papa Do's. But Papa Do's is a yuppie place. Well, that's, that's a foo foo place. That's with all it. due respect to people. To the foo foo place. Yeah. And but finally, we said enough is enough. enough. And we stopped wasting money. Yeah, yeah it took us a while. But. Took us a while. So we're telling you all this so it won't take you a while. That's right. That's it. Finally, a heart that has had its soul turned with the rocks yeah. removed and the weeds picked out is prepared to receive proper seed yeah. and bring forth an abundant harvest. Mm. God wants us prepared and operating in the end time office of the giver. He wants us prepared properly to function in the kingdom mm -hmm. business. Amen. One last verse. All right, Matthew 25, 13. This is in the Living Bible. So stay awake and be prepared for you do not know the date or the moment of my return. Don't waste another minute. Yeah. Start preparations tonight. Today is 66, 76 days left. Tomorrow is 75. That's right. So start tonight thinking about things that you can do for the next 76 days to, uh, to make them the most meaningful of your life. Yeah. And remember this. Nothing is impossible That's right. to those who believe. Amen. And when it comes to preparation... You need to know that prior proper preparation precipitates positive progress and programs preventing possible predicaments. <laughs>
that's so, good. And yeah. the jury, yeah, the, in 2016, we'll never return. That's it. So we have to make the very most of it. That's exactly I right. think one of the best, the family circus, I guess, little cartoon that was in there, showed the grandma out there with the little kids. And uh, it shows that looking off into the sunset, and she goes, you know, uh, something to the effect of when that sun sets, you know, a part is coming, is leaving that will never return again. And, you know, it's the truth. You know, it's, don't, it's don't a matter of... Don't ever take a day for granted. That's this whole right. Thing, I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. Yeah. Do it today. Now. This is the time. This is the day. Mm -hmm. It's your day. To get ahead. That's get right. Get prepared. Make the most, maximize Amen. the next 76 days. Amen. Hallelujah. You've been blessed by the teaching. Take your mouse. Go to the top where it says sow a seed. Just ask God what seed he'd have you put in the ground. And uh, make sure you join us. Yes. Every morning, 8.30 Eastern, Rich Salts for breakfast. Start that day right. And while you're at the website, check out this week's two-minute video. That's it. You'll be glad you did. Amen. Till tomorrow morning, God bless you. Happy trails. And keep thinking rich thoughts. We're going to go have some more cake. We'll eat some for you. <laughs> Good night.